So, um, oh, is it on? Um, yeah, no, it's on. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Okay, so uh, let's continue on from where we left off. So, we were. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, we were talking about this uh, belt inequality, or actually it's called the CHSH Cloud of Orange Moon Pulse. That's the guy that I didn't couldn't remember the last lecture. Um, CHSH inequality. So, this is quite a famous inequality in sort of the foundation of quantum physics. And uh, what we were doing is just to kind of um, walk through how it works. So, so um, just to revise what we were doing, we were looking at a kind of a classical case. In the, in the, this, this inequality is built from classical physics, but just regular probability theory. So this is exactly where it should apply. So this is verifying that the inequality actually uh, does actually work. So uh, we're looking at a case where um, there's some source that's producing pairs of balls, red and blue, and uh, there's some measurement device that you need to independently flip their switches and other output outputs, one or minus one, and each of these switches uh, switches between kind of two rules, um, so you can choose these rules as you like um, along the, uh, the um, output, so one or minus one. So you can choose this one as being minus one, one, or even minus one, minus one, or one, one, any, any uh, combination of uh, potential sort of rules that you can have. So you can allow to have two of these, and now it's also allowed to have two of these. And so um, what we did, we got up to last time, was to evaluate the CHSH inequality for this particular set of rules. I just chose this kind of randomly. Um, and uh, you can see that, so for this uh, set of rules, so for example, if you did A, B, so what you'd have to do is you'd need to multiply the A and the B columns. So in this case, both all cases give one because this one times one is one, minus one times minus one is also one. So basically, it always gives one, um, and so actually, it doesn't really even matter. The probability of the half half could have been anything, and this would be one. Right? Um, A and B prime, so this column and this column. So you can see that these are sort of anti-correlated. So when this one's one, it, it gives minus one. This one is minus one, this gives one. So in this case, actually, all cases, well, there's only two cases, but uh, it's minus one. And so on. And so if you plug it into the formula, uh, what you find is that uh, there's always a one minus sign of this formula somewhere. And if you add them all together, you find that this is equal to two, which is consistent with the general result, so yeah, the general result uh, here. So this thing in general is at most two. Okay, so that's uh, the classical case. So now let's do the quantum case. Um, and uh, I think I already told you that uh, in the quantum case, actually it's possible to beat this bound of two, two, uh, of, of two, and then actually give a value of Maybe I shouldn't have told you the answer so that uh, we should uh, calculate it ourselves. Okay, so this time what we're going to do is um, start with this entangled state. And uh, remember that um, uh, we can define observables. And remember that um, the observable which we're calling Z what that actually means, what Z actually means is, well, okay, so in terms of the matrix, it's, it's, it's this. Um, what it actually means is that, uh, well, okay, so, um, it, it basically means assign the value of um, the value so the outcome So 
basically means we do a measurement in the this zero one basis, and then if we get a value zero, we assign a value of one to it. We get a value if we get the state one, then we assign a value of minus one to it. Right? Remember the the general observable matrix um, is always defined as okay, so I'm going to call it M or something. No, I didn't call it M. Let's call it A. So the general observable matrix is always uh, defined something like this, where this N is this is the basis that you're choosing, and A N are the individual outcomes that we're measuring. Right? Oh, sorry, that we're assigning to each of the outcomes. And then so we can construct such a um, matrix and by uh, constructing such a matrix it makes our life easy later because when we want to do things like the average value of A, then all we have to do is we have to we can just sandwich this A by the state that we uh, want to calculate the average with respect to, and then that actually gives the same result as if you did it the sort of the um, kind of definition way of uh, first, you know, measuring that outcome, finding the probability, measuring that outcome, you know, finding the probability, and then assigning outcomes to it. Um, yeah, so this gives the equivalent result of this probability and the values here. So by the, th this one, I mean the value, this is the matrix. So it's not confusing. Okay, so um, uh, so firstly, uh, you know, is this sort of consistent with the thing that we were talking about before? Because uh, we, you know, we have this uh, CHSH inequality, but I mean, if it's not kind of consistent with it, like if we're kind of doing something completely different to the assumptions, then we can't really use it, right? So. Um, <coughs> So is this sort of consistent with what we were doing before? And I, I'd say yes, it's, it's quite consistent because basically what's happening is that, okay, so you've got some measurement device, so this is Alice's measurement, and you're going to do some measurement, okay, you measure in some basis, okay, fair enough, uh, and then you get some probability, and then there's various outcomes, and then you define a value of 1 or minus 1 to it. So it seems like the rules are completely the same as what we did before, um, because, well, you know, you're going to get probability when you do a measurement, right? Just like before, and you're going to assign values of one or minus one to it. That's for the Z case, uh, and 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 uh, then we're going to do averages and things. So, um, uh, what about the X measurement? So remember, this X matrix was something like this. And um, in this case, the, uh, the rule is uh, similar. So you, um, okay, it's not very easy to see. Um, so in this case, actually, the, for, for this uh, so-called X basis, uh, plus, yeah, so for this observable, what we're calling X, um, actually, this is consistent with basically this rule, where instead of it being a uh, zero one basis, it's actually a plus minus basis. Okay, so let me show you how well that that's actually true. So, um, uh, well, okay. So let, let's not say that it's equal to x, but let's say that our observable here just is going to follow this rule here, right? So. So here we've got our observable. Um, so whatever this, you know, this this one is here. So that one, uh, we're assigning a value of one to the state uh, for this outcome. So we're following this observable rule, right? And here it's minus. Okay. So uh, here I've just done the definition of what that rule is, right? So I haven't said that it's equal to this yet. I'm going to try and show you that that's true. Okay, so let's just now evaluate this. Um, so we can 
we can rewrite it into the matrix form um, so that we can compare to that. So the this is a uh, it's a vector, right? So, <coughs> um, so basically, uh, this plus minus measurement assigning values of one minus one is uh, the observable matrix for that is just f. Okay. So, so uh, what we're going to choose here, and you might be wondering, what, why am I, what, what, what's with these choices? You know, um, you know, uh, you know could I choose some other one? Um, so the answer is is that uh, you can choose any two uh, sort of observables, so long that it follows always this rule, right? So there's one or minus one, it's finding values of one or minus one. Um, basically, the choice that you really have is like what basis that you choose. So uh, we could have, we could equally do something like y, y matrix, and then that actually corresponds to like you know plus y state minus. Actually, there's many different choices of states that you could do. And um, uh, basically, what we are sort of allowed to do in terms of this CHSH inequality is basically, uh, so long that it has this two value outcome, um, you know, we could choose any, any kind of uh, measurement. And um, I'm going to choose these ones because. Basically, well, you know, done the calculation before, and these are the choices that give the the largest um, violation of the CHSH inequality. So it um, it uh, shows it's kind of the optimal choice, right? Okay, so it's, it's not obvious from from this at all. In fact, you you would not really even probably be able to guess it. Um, you, you have to sort of do a calculation. So I'm just giving you the optimal values already. Okay. And <coughs> for both side, you if you make this particular choice of observable, um, Z plus X to O to Z minus X to O to root two. And um, you might think, okay, so oh, is that is that still an observable? Um, <coughs> so uh, it actually is. Um, what it actually corresponds to is uh, using the basis um, measurement um, coin, so define it like this. We can draw it this state in terms of the block sphere. <coughs> so remember our block sphere. So um, so here's our x-axis, z-axis, y-axis goes somewhere there, and <coughs> This state is, uh, in terms of the block sphere, somewhere in the uh, Zx plane. So it's uh, sort of, how do I draw the Zx plane? Yeah, well, okay, so it's sort of uh, a bit hard to draw, actually. Uh, it's somewhere sort of like, like this. Um, and <coughs> that angle there, oh, okay, sorry. Um, I, I didn't put in a factor of theta over two. So in terms of this parameter, 
parametrization. Uh, I think this is actually two here. Okay. So if, uh, the, if the theta that we've defined it like that is pi over four, then uh, the angle is pi over two, and it's along the x-axis. Okay. So I just I just did, did it that way probably because it's easier to write. Um, okay, so <coughs> so the basis that I'm choosing for Bob's first measurement is some something like pi over eight. Okay, and so in terms of block three angles, it's actually uh, actually twice that. So the actual angle is like forty five degrees between z and z and x. This this one is so so redraw it's forty five degrees this way. So this one is what I'm calling okay, so this is why I should have stuck to the original parametrization with the factor of two so that it looks a little bit nice when I draw it like here. But uh, the one that I'm calling pi over eight is the state that's pointing forty five degrees this way. And if five pi over eight would be because it's multiplied by two, so uh, what's five pi? Five pi over four is pi and quarter, which I think is equivalent to probably minus minus. I think it's equivalent to minus pi over 4, is that right? 5 pi over 8, and then, okay, so if the uh, kind of block sphere angle is 5 pi over 4, then if I subtract 2 pi, so um, 8 pi over 4. Oh yes, yes, yes. Sorry, sorry. I'm getting confused over. Um, yeah, yeah. So sorry. The orthogonal states on a block sphere are always um, exactly uh, opposite to each other. So, like, for the block sphere, remember that this this state here is uh, the state zero. Uh, this state here is one. I think I might have forgot to mention this point. There's a one very confusing thing about the block sphere. So remember um, when we uh, talk about orthogonal states, like you know, zero and one are orthogonal states, right? So zero and one. And then what uh, I think I started off in the course uh, as kind of a way to visualize this is I was drawing the um, these these states as well, right angles, because, well, of course, um, that's usually what we associate with um, as uh, orthogonal vectors, right, normally. Um, but uh, in the block sphere, that rule does not work. <laughs> okay, so it's a kind of a, it's a kind of a mental trap which I just, I kind of fell into just right now. So in the block sphere, actually, because the block sphere is a parametrization of just all the states that are available to a qubit, you know. So um, uh, that visualization just does not work. Um, and on the block sphere, actually, the states that are orthogonal to each other are actually uh, those which are like opposite ends. So, for example, here, this state here is zero. It's a zero state, and actually, the one state is down here at the south pole. So it's just a different visualization, and it's a it's a trap that you can easily fall into, which I walked straight into just right now too. Uh, but um, but actually, uh, it's it's not it's not that either one is wrong. It's just these are all just different visualizations um, with different ways of uh, kind of intuitively understanding the state. And uh, um, for the block sphere. Yeah, just orthogonal states are, are not orthogonal. 
uh, polynomial states are actually on the opposite ends of the, of the um, sphere. So, so uh, for this state, which is pi over a, the orthogonal state is just the, the, the one that's pointing in the other direction. Okay, so this one would, 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 would be the uh, one I've, I've labeled by pi, pi over a. Uh, the three for this one, uh, it's going to be these states which are, uh, so here's the one which I've labeled 3 pi over 8, and then the orthogonal state to that, which is the 7 pi over 8 one, is uh, the one on the pointing in the other, other direction. Okay. Um, and uh, of course, th this uh, zero state is pointing up here, and the one state is down. And then this plus state here, which is, this is one of Alice's measurements, it's um, along the plus x direction, or the other one is along the minus x direction. So this one here is plus x, and the other way is minus. So, so basically, uh, basically what you're seeing here is, well, there is a kind of a symmetry to this, to the basis choices. So, Essentially, it's like, you know, all the states which are separated by sort of 45 degrees to each other. So this one is one of Alice's basis measurements. Uh, here's the other one, which is 90 degrees along on the box here. Um, and one of Bob's ones, this is like 45 degrees, and then the one that's pointing the other way. Or uh, uh, 3 pi over 4. Update that for theta over two, so we don't get confused. But anyway, those are the optimal basis choices for reasons. Well, you know, you can optimize it, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to do that. Okay. Any questions? I hope that was not too confusing. Uh, no, I do understand the result, but how do we deduce? Uh, why are these optimal? The state. Yeah. Why are these optimal? Um. I'm not even explaining that. <laughs> um, uh, <coughs> let's uh, let's look at the result and see if we can kind of get some intuition from why that should be the optimal. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, I just I'm just just going to sort of tell you that those are the optimal measurements. So let's. Uh, Let's go and evaluate some of these ones. So maybe you can get some pen and paper. And so basically what I want you to do here now is, uh, so these are Alice's choices, right? So this is, um, this one is what I'm defining as A. So A is Z. And then A prime is X. And B is this thing here, and then B prime is that. And the state is 1 over root 2, 0, 0, plus 1, 1. And, um, okay. Maybe I'll do one example for you so that um, you can get the feel for how to do the calculation. So look, let's just do the first one. So let's try and calculate AB. Or do you want an example or example please? <laughs> okay. So A B, we want to calculate A B. So as we know from that rule up there, that rule up there, um, that's the wave function sandwiched by the operators. And now let's substitute the expressions for the operators. So this is A is Z, right? And I'll put the tensor product symbol. Um, what is this? Minus, minus Z plus X over root 2. Okay. And uh, let's we can multiply this out. This constant can just 
come out the front. Okay. So we've got Z as a product with Z plus X. Check I've got that right. Yep. Okay. And then we can multiply out actually this tensor product here. So it's going to be Z. Z on alpha, this is Z on bulb, plus Z on alpha, plus X on bulb. Okay. And we can actually do this separately. I think that's easier. So Z alpha, Z beta, plus Z alpha. This far, okay, well, let's take another take a step further. Um, our state now, so we can now sub start substituting our state. Okay, so this factor of there's, there's two of these because there's the bra and the kit, right? So it's a half. Plus a half of zero zero plus one one of Z A X B Okay. Okay, now uh, what's Z A Z B acting on zero zero state? Actually, Z A acting on zero state, tensor product of Z B acting on zero state. And then here we can see that Z acting on zero, it just gives zero. And Z, well, same. So that's just zero, zero. acting on 1, 1. It's still 1, 1. Right. So why is there no sign change? Because there are two multiples. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, good. So, so, same. So actually, this one doesn't do anything to the state. Okay. Do this one. So remember our rules here are x acting on zero becomes one, and x acting on one becomes zero. Okay. So z a x b acting on zero zero. But what does that become? Uh, but the x is going to 
going to do something, no? So that, that's uh, that's the first one. <laughs> do you think you can do the other ones? Yeah. Okay. So wh why don't why don't you do like uh, which one do you want to do, Jane? Uh, They're all equally hard or easy. How about you do the second one? Okay. Okay. Without the minus sign, so just a b prime and. Uh, do the third one. Do the third one. Okay. Okay, I'll give you a few minutes to do it.
what you get. Same as this one? Okay. Alright, uh, that sounds right. Danny? Uh, plus, uh, the plus, sign, plus 1 over root 2. Okay, that's perfect because so this gives minus 1 over root 2, so it's plus, but then there's a minus sign here already. It also gives minus. I think I'm out by a minus sign in terms of uh, what I've got there. So, so long that this one is minus, right, then it'll be, every term will be minus 1 over root 2. Yeah. And then there's the absolute value sign. So. so this should give 2 root 2, um, which, uh, which is larger than 2. So, sorry, ignore this, uh, my calculation here. I've got a minus sign definition somewhere wrong in my calculation or something like that. Um, okay, so, so it gives something bigger than 2. Okay, so, um, uh, so basically, you know, what... Uh, well, what went wrong, or you know, why? Why is it that we can actually somehow beat um, this uh, classical prediction? Um, and uh, really, you know, there's not much. The, I think the beauty of this CHSH or the Bell inequality is that actually, you know, there's not so many assumptions there, right? You just really, uh, you don't assume anything about, you know, so what are the nature of these balls uh, coming between these two devices? Really, you know, the only information that you are given is that, okay, you've got some kind of random, random system. Uh, you've got some switches here and it randomly gives 1 or minus 1. Uh, and then there's some statistics which if uh, you have some um, probability distribution, then it always comes out to you know, obey this thing with, uh, with, a, with a 2, right? And really the, 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 the only assumption that really goes into it is that basically these things are kind of independent, right? So when we define this thing, this correlator AB, um, the, the form that this took was something like, you know, something A and something B, so it's like a product of these things. Uh, namely, that it was not uh, some common distribution like this. So basically what that means is that Alice and Bob, they have to independently have some rule uh, in order to determine whatever their outcomes are going to be. So a bit like, you know, like over here. So they, they independently have some rule like this. Uh, what they couldn't do is to say, um, okay, so now, you know, this time it's red. And then you know they phone each other up and they say, okay, let's do this. Um, they basically, you know, uh, are not allowed to do that because that, you know, would not have this this kind of form where it's like it's a product of these observables um, for each k. So um, this is called a kind of a, a local realism in the in the jargon. Uh, of physics, meaning that basically, you know, these uh, quantum, well, sorry, these, these particles, you know, have some um, kind of identity which is, uh, you know, completely tied to their um, local nature of, of, of these particles that are kind of arriving. So, so in this scenario, you know, it really is a local realist theory because 
you know, Bob really gets a blue ball here, it's really blue, and then from the fact that it's blue, he has to, you know, do some kind of rule. Um, but in, in this quantum case, this entangled state is somehow, it, it's not really completely, uh, you know, local in this, in this sense, because this state is actually kind of common to, to both of these, right? So it's not that, you know, you have some independent states that uh, Alice and Bob receive, which is sort of more like, you know, this, this, this picture that you know, I drew. This is sort of a case where, you know, they've individually got uh, some particle. Um, this kind of quantum state is, you know, it's sort of the one system that they are both accessing. Right. So this state is actually, you know, basically the trick of why uh, this quantum system can can beat this uh, classical bound is because um, you know th they have a sort of a common system that they are both probing, and basically what's happening is that you know when Alice does some measurement. Uh, remember the discussion in the last lecture where Alice does a particular measurement and then that state gets kind of affected on Bob's side, right? So if Alice does a, a Z measurement, then Bob gets uh, a 0, 1 state. Right? Alice does a plus minus, then Bob also gets plus minus. And um, so uh, you know, kind of what Alice is doing is affecting what Bob is doing, and this is why you can uh, sort of violate this spell of inequality. Um, so, I, you know, so you asked before, you know, why are these not optimal cases? Um, so I, I think it's something like, uh, it's something related to that, so this is not really a very good argument, but basically, Imagine if Alice does this measurement slightly before Bob, right? Mm -hmm. so then it will collapse to either 0 or 1. And uh, if, if Bob had chosen his basis so that it's either 0, 0 or, or, or the plus basis, then I think you basically recover the same kind of result as the classical case. But because Bob actually makes the measurement kind of halfway between so it does, you know. So it sort of doesn't matter whether Alice is going to measure zero or, or in the plus basis. By kind of going halfway, halfway between the zero and plus states, you can kind of catch a little bit of both, right? And uh, when you do this, you know, the kind of the, the reason we saw over here, the reason why this didn't break. Uh, this bound of two was basically because there's no way of choosing this so that you can get like all these four things to be positive, right? So basically, if like you can make this to be positive, this to be positive by making that negative, right? This to be positive, but then as soon as you do that, that becomes minus, and then these two cancel and you get two, right? So the way to kind of beat this is to make sure each each one of these four terms has some contribution, right? And so, so long that this contribution is bigger than a half, it will be beat this bound, right? And so, so it happens that uh, in quantum mechanics, so like, you know, choosing it halfway, you, you kind of get that situation where you get four contributions from all four of those terms, and they're, they're all bigger than a half. So, that's not really a, a proof or anything like that, but it might give you sort of a bit of an idea of why why th this this basis is the best? Yeah, that part of the term. Yeah, hand wave exponential. Okay, uh, and then finally for this chapter, so um, so you know these. Uh, so I just mentioned some recent results. So this is results from. Uh, Jian Wei Pan's group uh, from 2017. So, um, famous experiment now. It's only you know, four years old, but already very famous. So, uh, they shot up a 
satellite producing this kind of entangled state, this one. So they made this from uh, photons. So they can shoot down like two photons, one, uh, and uh, you know, so this, these are two observatory, basically telescopes right? um, in China. And uh, each of these, well, they're in this particular state, so they can do exactly this calculation or this experiment that we were talking about. Um, and remember, uh, you guys calculated, you know, each one of your results was like 1 over root 2. 1 over root 2 is 0 0.707. Right? So this is the experimentally measured thing. So you can see it's um, close to 0.7. This one is not so much, but um, experimentally you never get the exact, exact results. These are the four different measurement settings. And uh, in these types of experiments, what they have to do these days is to kind of really show that there was no chance of um, Alice and Bob communicating with each other because that's really what spoils uh, or you know, kind of proves that quantum mechanics is, has this non-local property. So um, to kind of prove that it was impossible for Alice to phone Bob and say, Hi Bob, I, I just got a blue ball. You know, do you know do your, do something like you know adjust your output so it's like this. So to prove that that is impossible, what what they actually do is they uh, make uh, these measurements like very closely uh, done in time. Okay, so this is a space time diagram. So this is sort of space. Okay, so this is like the physical distance between these observatories, which is a about 1,200 kilometers, and I don't know what the axis units here are, but you know it's probably like you know very small, you know I don't know microsecond <laughs> uh, Google Docs paper, and uh, this is the point that they choose which setting that they're going to do their measurement. You know, is it going to be B or B dash? So there's some random number generator to choose is it B or B dash. And then uh, some small time later, then they do the measurement. And what these triangular things are, this is like the, um, it's, it's called the light cone in physics. And uh, what this means is like, imagine if there was a, like a light signal that was traveling right towards the other, other person. Right? So this is Bob, this is Alice. Right? So imagine there was, you tried to communicate um, between Bob Alice and said, okay, I'm going to do this measurement result and you know, maybe you can get this measurement outcome. You know, they, they would try to communicate to each other, but basically, because nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, what this shows is that if this is kind of before this, uh, it shows that even if you try to do that, the, the light signal would not arrive in time for you to make that measurement. So unless you're faking your measurements or something, um, basically it would be impossible to reproduce the, these types of correlations um, because so there's no time to even kind of cheat and send so a signal. So does it mean that only if M1 and M2 are both in within the like the cross section of the two black holes? Yeah. Then they, so if they're in the middle part, they, they can yes. kind of trust it. So that when they're not, they cannot. That's right, that's right, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So that, that, that shows that it would just be impossible for them to kind of, uh, well, yeah, uh, yeah, so there's, there's definitely no communication happening between the two L symbols. Um, so, you know, so people, you know, this is maybe one of the latest experiments, and, uh, so it's, it's a good, in terms of doing this experiment, to definitely show that there's no communication happening between the two parties. Uh, of course, you know, it's easier if these are further and further separated. So um, there's like less and less, oh sorry, more time that, that, that becomes impossible to um, uh, communicate between the two. 
So, um, um, yeah, so this is you know, why they demonstrated with this satellite, because of course you can make very long distance entanglement using such satellites. Okay. Questions? Yeah, so, you know, it, I, think, I think it's kind of, like, interesting that this field is, you know, it kind of mixes all kinds of slightly philosophical aspects and um, kind of shows that, quantitatively, that, you know, it's something quite different is happening to what we experience in classical physics. Um, and, you know, you have to sort of think merge all these different concepts from sort of information to uh, relativity to, you know, space, rocket science. So it's kind of a really interdisciplinary kind of field, which is, I think, what makes it quite a sort of an interesting kind of area. Okay, so if there's no questions, then why don't we make a start on the next topic? So, uh, so we're finally getting on to quantum gates and stuff like that. Um, so uh, somehow the way that we've uh, done this course is to sort of do this last. In, in many courses you almost do this first. Okay. Um, but, okay, but let's, let's get going. So, um, so up to this point, we, we basically just kind of looked at this wave function. So we said, you know, here's a wave function. This is, describes states of physical systems. Um, and we never really said uh, how you can make it. I was just telling you, here's a state. Look, look, look at the properties, look at the entanglement, all this stuff. Um, and... Uh, and uh, and, and basically, uh, you know, look at things like uh, time. You know, there, there was no concept of time evolution or anything like that. Um, so that's basically what we're going to talk about uh, in this section. So, um, so just like in uh, classical physics, of course, uh, time is a very important quantity, right? So uh, you know, we started off. I think right at the beginning, talking about this guy kicking this football, and um, that's just a classical physics problem. But you know the type of problems that we try to solve in classical physics are things like you know here's our ball, this is where it is at the initial point in time, and we kick it, and then you know what happens to the ball afterwards? What's its trajectory? You know how does it behave? So you know predicting how uh, things behave from some initial condition and then sending it forward in time is kind of a pretty uh, uh, natural thing to do in classical physics and um, also this is true in quantum physics and how do you incorporate time into a quantum wave function well it's quite simple um, essentially here's our stake here right and we describe this particular state with some coefficients a, a n, and so of course just those coefficients now take the time. So it's as simple as that. And uh, we have to have it so that all these coefficients are always normalized, and so not just you know at time t equals zero, but uh, it should always be normalized at any any time. So choose any time, and these things should normalization. So that means in terms of these coefficients that the modulus squared is equal to 1. So, um, uh, yeah, so we can also think of, um, um, you know, so how does this, you know, or how or why does this wave function change? Well, uh, th this is exactly the same as sort of classical physics too. 
So, you know, a ball could just be naturally rolling down a hill. So, you know, humans are not really involved. It's just like, just rolling. Um, it's just gravity. Even if people weren't there, it, it would just be rolling. So there was, there's that kind of motion due to just a natural uh, kind of evolution. Um, but also, you know, humans can intervene and, you know, pick up the ball and go and kick it and, and do things like that. So, of course, you know, humans have the ability to control things. Uh, we can put arms and feet. So, uh, in a similar way, actually, we can do all these things sort of these days also with quantum mechanics. So, there's a sort of a, a natural evolution, maybe just some magnetic fields or, you know, some reason that the quantum system just naturally behaves. Or we can like shoot lasers at it and, you know, apply, get a big coil and then apply a magnetic field and kind of intervene and, and change the quantum system uh, according to how we want uh, just ourselves. So both of those things are, are possible. Okay, so, um, uh, so what is the way that we work out how things evolve in time? So, you know, in classical physics, somewhat, uh, basically you can work out the, uh, everything in a way from Newton's laws, right? So, F equals, you know, if you know F equals MA, in principle you've solved any problem, or you, you could solve any problem in classical physics. So, you know, you work out how this behaves because you know the initial velocity and the forces, and then you know you solve some equations and, and you can work out how it behaves, right? So, um, the analogous type of equation, in the sense that it is sort of the universal equation that tells you how everything behaves. So it's, there's no forces or anything in quantum mechanics. It's kind of a different different concept. It's actually more like an energy type concept. So it's, you might be familiar that you, know, you can work out some of these things from an energy perspective. So it's actually a little bit more similar to that, but even it's not totally the same. But in terms of the role that you are looking at, uh, Schrodinger's equation, there uh, is the equation that is the sort of the central equation of quantum mechanics and in principle you can work out how things evolve in time just by solving Schrodinger equation. So, um, so that's the equation. Now we'll basically talk about what all these symbols mean in a minute. Um, uh, this is usually the way that it's written. Okay, so there's some kind of time differential, and then there's this thing called Hamiltonian, which I'll explain in a minute. Uh, another way to actually write this is uh, something like this, and um, it's the exponential of some Hamiltonian, and then multiplied by a vector. So, so I'll explain this in more detail in, in the slides that are coming, but. Usually this is the one that actually most people use, but actually this is the one that we'll be using mainly. So, okay, and basically what this does is that it has some initial um, state, and then there's this exponential blah blah blah, which uh, we'll be talking about, and then what that does is that it finds what the new wave function is some time later. So basically, uh, by kind of working out this right-hand side, you can work out what the wave function is going to do sometime t later, uh, starting from some initial set. Okay, so let's, let's break it down. So this is the equation that we're mainly going to be looking at. Um, so let's go through it one by one. Okay, so uh, I, well, we all know what I is. So T is the time of second. Uh, H bar is just a variable that um, people like to define. Um, and it's just a constant, actually. And uh, it's H divided by 2 pi, where H is 
some number, kind of units of joules per second. And it's quite a small number, as you can see. H bar is just that constant divided by 2 pi. And for some reason, uh, I don't know who started it, but um, people started to use this uh, notation. Okay, so it's just a constant. Okay, so everything else is pretty you know, straightforward. So, of course, that's exponential. But uh, the most complicated thing in here is actually this thing called the, the Hamiltonian. And, uh, and, and basically what this thing is, is it's, firstly, it's a matrix. Okay? It's a matrix of the same dimension as the, the vector that we're talking about. All right? So this, this is our initial state, say it's a qubit. So a qubit is a two-dimensional vector. Uh, if we're talking about a qubit, then this Hamiltonian will be also a, a matrix, two-dimensional matrix, or be a two-by-two two matrix. Okay. And this is a matrix, and basically what it does is tell us, uh, it's, it's as simple as this. So it tells you what states have what energy. Basically, that's basically what, what all, all it really is. Um, so, for example, let's say you had some atoms and it's got a bunch of energy levels. And uh, say, you know, this state has that energy. So we can use any, any units that you want. Well, no, actually, you can't. Um, uh, if we're using joules here, then we also need to use joules there. Uh, if you're using some other units, then this, this will also need to be converted. Okay. So you can just use joules. So, uh, yeah, in joules, uh, you've got that state, that's energy. And then here's another energy level, got a different energy, E1, and so forth. And these states, these energy states, are all um, orthogonal to each other, as we've usually we've been kind of dealing with um, up until now. So it has its orthogonality property that if you take the overlap of different or inner products between different states, they have uh, either zero or one. Well, okay, different states have overlap zero. Same state has overlap one because the states are also normalized. So, so that's actually all the Hamiltonian is. Now, the uh, complication, if you like, is that, you know, you might think, okay, fine, energies and states, and not so, so complicated. But the complication is that these states here uh, could be sort of in any basis that you, that you might choose. Okay, so this is why the, the Hamiltonian is uh, not just going to be always some simple, say, diagonal matrix. The, the way I've written it, it looks diagonal, right? So it looks like it might be a matrix that looks like something like this, E0, E1, E2, and all these other elements are zero, right? So it looks like that when I write it like that. But the thing is, is that basically I've used this basis, which is like E0, E1, and so forth. But then if this basis is actually uh, some funny state, for example, um, well, okay, so here's a simple, simple example where it's a, say, a magnetic field and an atom. In this case, um, the states are just, say, the, the states of the atom, zero and one, okay, um, and then you put a magnet near it and then these energy levels shift. So that's a little bit of atomic physics, you don't have to worry about why or I don't even know why it just does. It just happens. Um, uh, and uh, so, so that's that's an example where the states are just the usual states. But uh, for example, if you shoot a laser at an atom for various reasons, which I'll again not go into, um, in this case the uh, energy, the relevant energy states are actually these so-called plus or minus states. Okay. And then in this case, actually the the matrix is not so 
necessarily so simple. Um, so for example, the Hamiltonian can be this sort of off-diagonal matrix. And suppose there's a magnetic field and you shoot a laser at the same time, then it's going to be like the sum of these two things, and then that could be you know, some funny looking matrix. So, so that's why the Hamiltonian will be in general a kind of a, a little bit of a complicated looking object. So... Uh -huh.